Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, welcome to this uh, first like breakout session of the second day at Tic Tech. Um, we're going to be sharing some learnings from three years of my society's climate program, working at the sort of intersection of climate and democracy. So this follows on really well from the the keynote and the the panel we just had. Um, and we, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how uh, we've explored the challenges that communities are facing around climate, um, identified solutions that we could test with data and technology, and then partnered with the right organisations to make those solutions effective. Um, and I'm joined by a colleague from one of those partner organisations, which is Don Von Rowland um, uh, from Climate Emergency UK, um, who will present some of the work they've been doing on collecting and uh, standardised data on local government action in the UK. Um, and he'll be followed by our third contributor, Julia Cushion, um, who's My Society's Policy and Advocacy Manager. Um, and she'll talk about how both civic tech organisations like My Society and local authorities can work together to push for more ambitious, more effective, more democratic action on climate. Um, between each of our short presentations, there'll be time for one or two questions, um, and then we'll have lots of time at the end for a wider discussion. Um, you can submit questions on Slido via the QR codes that are at the top of most of our slides, um, uh, or you can read and upvote other questions from people that you want to see answered. Um, and I think we've also got at least one question that we might be asking of you later on as well, which you can vote on through that Slido. And we're going to be running, I think, through until lunch at 12.30, so get comfy, and we'll kick off by casting your minds back to 2018. Um, so this feels like, a when I was writing this, this feels like a very long time ago. So um, on the world stage, uh, Sergei Skripal had just been poisoned um, with Novichok in Salisbury. Uh, the Gilets Jaunes were storming the French capital. Um, Journalist Jamal Khashoggi um, had just been assassinated in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Um, and the latest IPP IPCC report had called for rapid and far-reaching transitions in land, energy, industry, buildings, transport and cities if we were to stand any chance of keeping global average temperature rise below one and a half degrees. And here in the UK, things were also hotting up. Um, 2018 saw the first councils declaring climate emergencies. Um, I think it started off with Bristol, Trafford, Forest of Dean, Brighton and Hove, all right at the end of 2018. And then in 2019, the year after, another 286 local authorities in the UK joined them. And for anyone here who's from outside the UK, when I talk about local authorities or councils, they're like the lower level or like sort of middle level of government in the UK. They look after things like waste collection, transport planning, building and permitted development, um, schools, leisure centres, things like that. Um, and these climate emergency declarations were the action and, and reaction to democracy uh, in action. Um, through elected representatives, in meetings like this, and also through protests and demonstrations um, that were happening in the streets. Um, when we started researching tools around this time that we could build to address climate action, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, one campaigner told us um, climate emergency declarations were made when people showed up at council meetings, which is really unusual. These were quite varied people, depending on local factors, asking questions and packing the gallery. Parents, kids, older people, councillors are not used to having people in the gallery there were demonstrations outside as councillors were going in, one person told us. Um, which, if you've worked in the democracy space, you'll get a feeling that doesn't happen that often. So clearly, people had got bothered about this. Um, Carla Denyer, who was the councillor who passed that, um, uh, proposed that motion in, in Bristol, said that uh, the people taking part are not the usual suspects. Although credit to them too, they include academics, professionals, journalists, lawmakers, grandparents, children, and those of all faiths and none. So we often say at My Society, climate isn't a global issue, it's a local issue everywhere. And citizens all over the UK were asking what their council was going to do about it. Um, and that's because uh, 
there was in, an increasing recognition around this time of the role of local, that local authorities could play um, in reducing carbon emissions. And so this is a quote from the um, CCC's uh, carbon budget in 2020, saying that from what they could tell, there were roughly a third of emissions locally were under the sphere of influence of local authorities. So that's things like the waste collection, the schools, the leisure centres that I mentioned earlier. Um, and yet, at the same time, there was no clear picture of the action that local authorities were actually taking. Um, over half of them had just declared a climate emergency. And, <laughs> like, what next? And luckily, at my society, we'd been here before. So in 2004, 20 years ago this month, um, They Work For You first started to scrape and republish the debates of MPs in the UK Parliament because we knew that democracy relies on all of us knowing what's being said and done in our names by our representatives on our behalf. And a few years later, uh, in 20, uh, 2008, we launched What Do They Know, uh, which everybody in this room already knows about, but it's a repository of public information uh, from freedom of information requests and responses, revealing what's happening at every layer of government and public service in the UK. And so we started to ask, what can my society do uh, that was along those lines? And the first place we started, um, thank you to Chris and Matthew who've appeared in this photo, um, uh, we recognise we're an organisation of data geeks. Uh, we are not climate specialists. Um, and so we need realised we needed to partner with real users of this data to have any sort of impact. And that's why we started with Climate Emergency UK, um, and Don will shortly talk about uh, some of the work we did together on that. And this idea of partnership has become a core concept of not just the climate programme at My Society, but the, the wider organisational strategy as a whole. Um, a kind of realisation that we can benefit from other organisations' domain expertise and as much as they can benefit from ours. Um, and in this case, that started off uh, as work on CAPE, uh, which at the time, as in the screenshot, was named the Climate Action Plan Explorer. Um, so that picked up on the sterling work that Climate Emergency UK had started in collecting all of these climate emergency declarations from local councils and laid on top of that a database of all of the plans that they'd started releasing. So we could start answering that question of, okay, they've declared a climate emergency, what are they doing about it? They were coming up with these plans and documents to say what they were going to do for the next five years. But it was impossible to find them, difficult to search across them, really difficult to even find your own local authority's plan because it's hidden in minutes somewhere. And so we put them all together in one, one website so that uh, for the first time, citizens, campaigners, and council officers themselves could search across all of the plans um, published by all the councils in the UK and see how each council in areas like theirs were addressing climate change. And since all of that data was open, it got reused and built upon by other people. So uh, here's an example, Carbon Copy. Um, they took the data, they present it alongside information about the, the declarations and the plans and case studies of local action, so what people on the ground are actually doing and what councils are doing um, uh, in the real world. Um, then uh, our database of plans then helped uh, Climate Emergency UK produce the uh, first round of the um, clim council climate plan scorecards. Um, so this was like the UK's first standardised assessment of uh, council climate action uh, in the UK. Um, which I'm sure Don will talk about in a minute. But before I hand over, I wanted to mention the second half of my, um, my pitch at the start, which is like how we went about trying to build these services. And maybe there's uh, something here that you could take home and reuse yourselves. Um, so over the course of 2022, uh, we ran a series of six prototyping weeks, kind of inspired by um, Google's design venture, um, Google Ventures design sprint. Um, and here's the topics we looked at. So uh, local authority procurement, um, especially looking at uh, um, high emissions procurement areas like waste and uh, building. Um, conditional commitments around home energy, so this is things like retrofit, energy saving, um, draft proofing, um, access to nature, work, skills, uh, energy efficiency for private rental homes, which was really interesting because of the power dynamics there between 
rental tenants and landlords and tenants not being able to change the fabric of the buildings. Uh, and then data sharing for uh, climate campaign organisations and charities. Um, and the structure of these uh, prototyping weeks was basically this. So for the first two days, we got everybody together into a Zoom room um, for like half day workshops on both days, doing the things that are right below that on the on the, the left there. So understanding what's working and what's not working at the moment in the space, um, coming up with crazy ideas uh, as to how we could solve this in an ideal world, and then trying to narrow down. So by the end, we'd got we'd identified with all of these participants from the real world, from outside my society, either they were citizens or council officers or um, other NGOs or representatives of uh, rental tenants or whatever, we'd identified some sort of thing that we could then focus on to then build in days three and four. So we put a very, very quick prototype together, just enough to present the ideas and ask some questions of people in day five. And we tested it out with about five to ten people during the day, quick calls to say, hey, if this sort of thing existed, would you use it? How would you use it? Like, would it solve this problem? Is there something missing from it? And then we'd present that to everybody who'd been involved in the week to say, here's what we found out, here's what you helped us find. And we published all that information on the website. So even if we didn't do anything more, we published all our materials and a report, and other people could go and pick it up. So all of that is a huge amount of work. Why bother? Um, I think the number one reason is that it helps us get very quick answers to questions uh, that we'd identified before. So um, we started building three things as a result of this prototyping week. One around advance notice of carbon heavy procurement contracts at local authorities so that people could write to their council or their councillors about things well before the council started making a decision about whether to renew that contract. Uh, one about uh, helping neighbours come together to um, take uh, home energy efficiency upgrades and things because it's difficult to do that work individually. Everybody has to reinvent the wheel. Surely it's easier if you all come together to do it. Um, and then one around improved data sharing for, uh, for, for humanitarian and climate organisations in the UK. Um, but it's also about finding where your organisation's skills and experiences can fit alongside others um, in the field. And we've gone on to partner with a number of organisations or work closely with them that we met first through these prototyping weeks. And really, for some organisations, all they needed to do was turn up for a couple of hours in the first day or the second day, and they get a feel immediately for who else is in the space, what we're working on. They feel like they've contributed a little bit. They've seen an output by the end of the week, um, and it's sort of opened up a conversation and a chance for us to work with other organisations. Um, so uh, I've got a couple of quotes there from people who actually did that. So they joined. Um, which are very nice, and I'm too modest to read them all out, which is very nice. Um, but people felt included, they enjoyed the process. So I think people who turned up to these prototyping weeks also get something out of it, as well as us getting out of it ideas of what services we could then try building and testing and iterating on. Um, if you want to see any of the materials and outputs from those, they're all on our website. As I mentioned, there's a URL at the bottom there um, under the, the climate um, section of our website. Um, but yeah, I think hopefully uh, that's given you an idea of maybe you could go away and try one of these things. It was really fun to work with. It was really tiring too. Um, and I would love to attend all of your design prototyping weeks if anybody <laughs> wants me to attend as a, as a punter. Uh, it'd be quite nice rather than having to organise one. Um, but uh, I don't know whether there's any questions right now. Um, there are, maybe. Ah, I don't know the question. Can we switch to the slider? I haven't got my phone unlocked. Um, uh, the question is, if you ran the prototyping weeks again, what would you do differently? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, one of the difficulties was timing. So trying to get people from the right organisations in the room in the right weeks was really difficult. We found that we had planned to run our week on jobs and skills in the same week all of the trades unions were having their their annual meetings, so nobody could attend from the trades union, which was really sad. Um, 
And I think, yeah, spacing them out a little more as well would have helped. Uh, it was quite tiring. We started off doing a week on and a week off for some of them, and a week's gap between them wasn't enough. Um, but at the same time, there's a challenge. We, did <laughs> we set ourselves the crazy goal of doing six of them um, over the summer, uh, and it felt like a long time. By the time we got to the end of that process, it felt like a very long time ago that we were working on the first one. Um, so maybe it's the kind of thing where you could just run one or two of them um, and try out, try out topics that you're particularly interested in at that time rather than like stacking them all together. But it was a really good experience. Um, I think we would definitely run them again. I will leave us lots of time for questions and hand over to John, I think, um, with yours. <laughs>